Amen. It's the Word of God. Praise God. Well, we want to welcome everybody today again and welcome our Facebook family and those tuning in, those that may not have been able to get here or those that are remote. We thank God for you. Your family. Family, we're koinonia and uh, praise God. But I have some things I want to share today. Um, things we already know, but I think it's, it's good to review and to go through some things. Talking about um, identification. I don't think you can minister enough along this line as to who we are and who we have become in Christ. You know, we can quote scripture, but the more you meditate and read it, then there, bec there comes not a mental knowing, but it's a knowing in, in your heart. And uh, so uh, I, I want to share that, you know, all the, the scriptures that come back to me, you know, when you, you plant seed, you know, the word of God is seed. It's the incorruptible seed of God that has caused us to become new creatures in Christ. And that incorruptible seed, the Passion Translation says, it lives in us forever. It'll never die. So if Jesus tarries and we leave this body and go to heaven, the seed, the incorruptible seed that has been planted in us, it says it will grow and live forever in us. Isn't that wonderful? So that means the word is what? Incorruptible. It's infallible. The word is Christ. It can never die. So if I plant this seed in me, it doesn't just, when I leave this earth and this body, it doesn't just, oh, well, we start over. Oh, no. Whatever you've planted, whatever you've worked and produced, it goes with you. Hallelujah. But I mean, obviously, when we get to heaven, we're going to know him in a greater measure, right? So we're going to see things that we didn't see in the word. But what we have received, what we've grown in, grown in this grace, it goes with us. But I wanted to just share along again on, on who we are in Christ and our identification, what we have. Because the more we know what we have, the more we'll walk in it. The more revelation, faith, the entrance of his word does what? Bringeth light. That means it bringeth revelation. So the more we feed upon this area, the more we feed on who we are, then we'll walk that way. We'll talk that way. We'll think that way. We'll think like him. We'll talk like him. We'll act like him in this body. And he'll operate in and through us. And we'll begin to walk and talk like him. Because it's what? No longer I that live, but it's Christ that lives in me. That's why when the scripture says, we can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. So I can do all things in this earth realm. How, why? He knew that without a new system of truth, without a new covenant, that what, what does the scripture say? It says, we, uh, I, I, I was going to jump in here. This is what I was looking up here. He, uh, the scripture says in, in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6, and we're just going to jump in here. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, and I'm going to give them a little time because I didn't give them this scripture. Verses 6 through uh, 10 in the King James. But when we talk about contracts, you really are using the word covenant. You know, anybody just looks up that word in the dictionary. If you look up a synonym for contract is covenant. So 
when he made this new covenant, when Jesus established this new covenant, he established a new contract. He established a new way of truth. You see. So Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6, it says, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is what? The mediator of a better covenant, a better contract, a better system of truth, a better way, a better covenant, which was what? Established upon better promises. See, and this is what I was saying here. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So we got a better covenant. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant. And then what? He, and, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. See, and he knew that that, that first covenant, could, they weren't changed. He wasn't living in them. So it didn't have the power to help them follow the law. So here in verse 10, for this is the covenant or the contract that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will what? Put my laws into their mind, write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. They shall be. Not might be, they shall be my people. And then Hebrews 10 and verse 16 and 17. Hebrews 10 verses 16 and 17. It said, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds Will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more? See, he entered in once into the Holy of Holies and did what? He obtained eternal redemption for us through the blood. So this contract, this covenant is sealed in his eternal blood. Cannot be broken. That was where, when you looked at, we read a few weeks ago in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1, it says that under the old covenant, the old contract, they had to do what? Every year they reminded the people of their sins because they offered up the blood of bulls and goats. But Jesus offered himself what? Once. And entered in and obtained for us eternal redemption. Hallelujah. So we have a better covenant. And it's in the blood. In the blood of Jesus. So this new covenant was sealed in the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. And what? It was deposited in heaven, in the heaven, heavenly holy of holies. So when we talk about identification, you know, to become an exact, uh, you know, in quality, we're exactly the same. When you identify with something, so now the question comes, becomes for all of us, what are we identifying with? You know, people like to identify with things. Some identify with sports figures. 
you know, you know, you could run a whole list of things. Some want to identify with your, you know, somebody you like. Nothing, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I'm saying the most important thing is who are you identifying with? Are you identifying with the covenant that we have? Are you identifying with your problems? Are you identifying with something that's already been paid for? And you don't realize it because you don't really know who you are. You don't know your covenant. And the more you feed upon the covenant, the more light comes in and the more you see who you really are. So that's when we talk about identification what am I identifying with? You know, most people, when they have a contract and they sign a contract and they have some contract, they identify with it. They say, that's mine. And boy, they fight tooth and nail to get what's in their covenant, their contract. So that's what are we identifying with? And there's so many things that we identify with today. Are we identifying with worry? You know, I'm just a worrier. You know, I get angry. You know, I'm just angry. Do you identify with that? You know, or what, what, what is it that you identify? You know, I, we just have the, and I know you know better than this, so I know I'm not talking to you. It's the people online. Because I know you've already heard this and been taught. I'm, I'm, but we all need to hear it again and again because what happens is when we walk through life and we're faced with situations, what can happen sometimes is we begin to think, well, maybe I missed it. Maybe I did something. Well, we just got done reading here and their sins... And iniquities will I remember no more. I mean, they were doing that under the old covenant. Jesus, why is this person in this condition? It must have been something in that, that, their, that their parents did. Or something they did. Didn't they do that? Sure did. So that tactic hasn't changed. So we need to... Know our covenant, and just like you heard stories of Brother Hagen, he said, I was reading another one. I read it every day. I read the daily health food and faith food. I like to read it every day. And he was sharing about how he was somewhere ministering, and at one or two in the morning, he said he woke up with the most alarming symptoms in his body. He said they were, they were alarming. That must have been pretty bad, right? And he said the devil spoke to him and said, yeah, he said, you know how those doctors said to you, you'll never get healed. He said, well, this is it. You're not getting healed. And he said he quickly pulled those covers up over his head and started to laugh. He just started laughing. Ha, 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 ha. And he laughed for 10 minutes. And he said the devil said to him, what are you laughing at? He said, I'm laughing at you. He said, you're not going to get your healing. And he said, I pulled the covers up and laughed another 10 minutes. And he said, I didn't feel, feel, I didn't feel like laughing. He said, the symptoms were that alarming. And he said, I kept laughing. And the devil said, you're not going to get healed. And he said, well, he said, why would I want to get healed? Why would I want to get something I already have? He said, Jesus already got it. So I don't need to get it. I got it. See, that's when you know your covenant and you have some alarming symptoms going on. He, now, this is what he wrote in this, this daily devotional. He said, don't get a guilt trip if you're not there yet. You're not there at that place to laugh at the devil. Pick up the phone and call the doctor if you need to. 
But don't keep living in that realm. Begin to live out of the kingdom. Live out of the, the covenant that we have and grow in this grace. Because you can put your trust in a doctor and the doctor goes, I'm sorry. There's nothing we can do. And then you know what people are doing? Oh, God, help me. Really? Why do we get, why do we wait to pound the doors of heaven? When somebody gives us a report that says, I'm sorry. Oh, no. When we know our covenant, the moment that thing hits, I'm not saying don't go to the doctor, but I'm saying you laugh. You take this covenant and you put it right up in the devil's face. I've already been healed. I'm already redeemed. I'm a brand new person in Christ. I am an heir of God. What is Romans 8, 17? I am an heir of God and a what? Joint heir of Jesus Christ. That means everything he got, I got. What does it say? We were crucified together we were buried and we were we were raised and we were seated in heaven <clears throat> so we're not asking him to come along no we're in him right glory to god i hope this 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 moves us a little bit so our true identity is in Christ. Our true identity is in the covenant, in the word. That's our true identity. It's in Christ. He is the word. So our true identity is identifying with who we are, what we have. What do I have? I have everything he got. Everything he secured for us in this better covenant. Right? This is really what we are to bring to the world. We are to bring to the world the good news. What's the good news? We have a better covenant. We have a better way of living. We don't have to live just hoping to get by beneath the problem. We're above the problem. This is the victory. Whosoever is born of God overcometh. Say overcometh. I overcome this world by my faith. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Didn't mean I'm not going to have some opposition. Didn't mean that my mind is not going to think some real squirrely thoughts. But I like what Brother Hagin used to say when he was alive. He said, you can't stop a bird from flying over, but you can sure stop it from building a nest. It's just a simple way of saying you're going to cast down vain thoughts and imaginations. You're not letting silly thoughts that oppose the word of God, that oppose our better covenant, better promises. When it opposes it, we know where it comes from. But for us, it's knowing this covenant. It's knowing who we are in Christ and keep feeding upon it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, I just keep thinking about, you know, when you, uh, when your mind has not been renewed, you know, we're all in stages of restoration or transformation, renewing our minds 
in Christ to the Word of God. So when we become or when we know to a, a, a degree, it's not just a confession that's made, well, I'm a new, I'm a new person in Christ. You know, we, we all say that. But boy, when opposition comes, and it comes from here, you go, you, you, you just stepped over the line. And you speak from the heart, you speak in faith from the heart, things change. And you begin to stand up in Christ. This is what we're all working towards. A, a degree of standing in Christ or identifying with who we've become in a greater way, in a greater measure. Because the tests, if anybody just, anybody here think that things are getting darker? I see a lot of heads nodding. Yeah. Things have, have, have escalated. I mean, you just turn on the news. You just see that the devil works through, what does it say in the King James? The children of disobedience. Those who will not follow Christ are open to following lies and deceit. He is the God of this world. And he said he what? He blinds the minds of those who what? Hello? Anybody here today? He says he blind King James. Okay, maybe quote it to me from what you know. Or do you know anything? I'm kidding. He says he blinds the minds of what? Those who are... L-O-S-T, lost. I'm helping you out here today. I know it's early. He's blinded the minds of those who are lost, lest the light of the glorious covenant should shine into us. So we are to do what? Bring this glorious light. And the more light we have, we are not being bamboozled. Even with the pressure, we're not giving in. We're not getting discouraged. We're not throwing the towel in. All of the opposition. Oh no, I'm in him. I have a better covenant. He's in me. He thinks through me. He's showing me how to walk through this challenge. He's showing me. And then what does it say? Once I know, I need to have some patience. Because most of us, we want it yesterday. We want everything yesterday. But when we know who we are, and opposition comes, we can stand up and we can walk through it. Didn't say it's not easy on the flesh. It's going, it might be difficult on the flesh. May even be a little difficult in your soul. But it's sure a lot easier on your soul when you know. When you know who you are. Hallelujah. So we've become a brand new person in Christ. <clears throat> this is... Uh, uh, we're familiar with this in um, 2 Corinthians. Um, this is the living Bible of 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, when someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. He's not the same anymore. A new life has become, has begun, I'm sorry. So I've become a brand new person on the inside, but I haven't become a brand new person in my soul. So I need to get some things changed up there, don't I? It says I need to be transformed by the renewing of my mind so I can prove what his his good and perfect will is. But on the inside, 
there, he's in me now. And he will reveal his perfect will to me. But the power of sin, I like this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. In uh, I'm going to read this from a translation called the Black Welder Translation. B-L-A-C-K Welder. It says, in our behalf, God identified him with everything, listen to this, everything in the whole realm of sin. He identified with everything in the whole realm of sin. Think about that. That's why I wanted to read this. He, he identified with the whole realm of sin, everything. That's the, 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 the fruit of sin. He identified with it. That's when it says he identified with us. He knows our weaknesses. He was confronted with it. And he overcame. He became it. And it was defeated. So everything you could think of today has been paid for. In the whole realm of sin, the very depths of sin, he paid for it. He identified with it. Wow. So when you, 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 you meditate on that, then we begin to go, okay, if he's in me and he's paid for sin and he's identified with the whole realm of sin, What's my excuse? There is none. Because he identified with it. So that we could, ident he identified with us. So we can in turn identify with him. And then it goes on. He, he identified God, identified him, Christ, with everything in the whole realm of sin. Listen. In order that by trusting him, see, there's the key. In order that by trusting him, we might become recipients of God's kind of righteousness. So we have to trust him and receive it. And not go by what? So we walk by faith. And not by our feelings and sight and what thoughts are coming. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And I have received this grace through Christ. <clears throat> this, is, this is another translation <clears throat> called the Wood Translation. It says, think of it. Christ, the sinless, was made the personification of sin for us. He was made sin in the whole realm of it. For all men, kind, I mean. And this goes on to say, in order that in union with him, we might become the very righteousness of God. So we've been redeemed. And I like this is uh, Galatians 2.20. I think we've read this before. And Galatians 2.20, this is the distilled translation. So we, we have a greater revelation, or if we had a greater revelation, of who we are in Christ and the authority that we have, we would not try to identify with the world and its ways. I mean, that goes for all of us, for us the gamut. We're all, as I said, we're all in various levels of growth. If we understood who we are, we would not try to identify with the world and its ways. We, we just wouldn't. 
we would know in a greater way who we are, you see. And that comes from feeding upon the covenant. But the distilled translation, it says, I consider, this is what it says, I consider myself as having died and now exist, enjoying a second existence, which is simply Jesus using my body. And I would dare say, and I would include myself, this has to become a greater revelation because the more we're, when we're confronted with things, we're thi what's the first thing? How, do I how am I going to fix this? How am I going to handle this? How am I going to do this? Why do we get discouraged if I'm not handling it? Why do I get discouraged? So you have to think about that. Get back to those basic truths. Why does one get discouraged? Because then if you get discouraged, that means you're thinking there's no way out. There's no solution. It's not changing. Then that means when I get to that place of discouragement, that's what the devil wants. He wants you to get discouraged and then just do what? Throw the towel and just give up and let go of your faith. Then he's got you. See, no matter, no matter what the situation is, if it's in the covenant, then, then I can have it. I just need to be patient because it's going to come to pass. It will come to pass. So for us, <clears throat> we really, I'm not saying feelings and thoughts of discouragement may not come. I am not saying that. We all experience that. We all experience that in some greater degrees than others. Sometimes maybe the magnitude of it, we're, we're like, ugh, I can't take this. Well, in Christ, I can. I can handle it. Didn't mean it's going to be easy on the flesh or the mind. But the more you stir up, the gift of God in you, and you stir up that eternal resurrection life that's in you, it's easy. We can overcome. And just like that's how you began, you know, you look at some of these stories that Brother Hagen had, he would just laugh at a circumstance. He would just laugh at it because he knew he had the victory in Christ. And the devil could not take that promise if he didn't give in. It was his. I like this. This is, um, this is the message translation of Galatians 2.20. You know, the message expands this a little bit. But I like this. says, uh, starting in verse 20, I identified myself completely with him. See, this is what we have to do. I have to identify myself completely with him. That means I'm identifying with the covenant. Not my problem. Not, not the, the circumstance. So it says here, we're going to continue, I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. Now, see, this is, this is where discouragement can come right in. It says, my ego <laughs> is no longer central. See, when we get our ego out of the way, then we don't get discouraged because it's not my deal. It's his deal. It's his problem not mine that's like brother Hagen used to say he, he would pray he'd say Lord if this doesn't come to pass I'm going to hold your word being a lie because you said if I did this it would come to pass and he would talk like that in prayer to the Lord and he would stick with the word till it came. Till the, till the answer came. So here, my ego is no longer central. 
It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. And I am no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. I don't need to impress him. He's in me. <laughs> Isn't that something? See, that's why when you, we, we try to do things to, to say, well, God, I did this. You're trying to impress God. No. He lives in me. He should be motivating us to do things and to pursue things because it's his body at work in the earth. I don't need to impress him. He needs to guide me and direct me, right? So it says here, Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Hallelujah. So he was the one that initiated our identification. It says, when, what does Ephesians say? When we, know, when we weren't even thinking about him, he died for us. So he initiated it. He initiated our identification with Christ. So it says, but that identification must be accepted and what? Mixed with what? Faith. So I've got to receive it, mix my faith with it, and receive the identification that I have in Christ. Glory to God. Romans, uh, Romans chapter 6. This is the Weymouth translation. Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7 in the Weymouth. And I like this because, you know, when we're, we're new Christians or at, at any stage, it, 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 Jesus said he was tempted in all ways like us but he didn't sin. So here in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, it says, This we know, that our old self was nailed to the cross with him. What does it say? In order that our sinful nature might be deprived of its power, so that we should no longer be the slaves of sin, for he who has paid the penalty of death stands absolved from his sin. So here, uh, I know this is the, the Phillips translation in verse 7. It says, for a dead man can safely be said to be immune to the power of sin. If you're dead, you are immune to some things, right? <laughs> you did. So if you are dead in Christ and it's he living in me, then it's his power in me that helps me overcome these impulses and thoughts and whatever, whatever you know, people deal with. It's him in me. So when those impulses come, attitudes come, we all face them. That's the point where when it seems overpowering, you just got to get up and go, nope. He's in me. And the more you say it, the more you confess it, and the more you step over and deal with it, it becomes easier. And it becomes alive in you. See? Sometimes folks <clears throat> want to get even, retaliate. That's, that's, that's just that old flesh nature. You know, it's it's... Sometimes it's, it's you push certain buttons and you keep pushing. See, it can, it can stir some things up. But that's where you just begin to confess and say the covenant 
who you are in Christ. I'm a new person in Christ. I don't think that way anymore. And you say that all the while, your thought is, I'm a dude as dude. Your thought may be that, and somebody doesn't even know that. You just smile and say, well, praise God. Praise God. Right? Praise God. And it, and it becomes less of a, a, a stronghold in our life, right? So uh, the uh, Philippians 2.13, in the Amplified Classic, <clears throat> says not in your own strength see this is this is where we have to get to that that place that we realize when i deal with things it's it can't be in my own strength i'm going to lose not in your own strength for it is god who all the while effectually at work in you energizing and creating in you the power and the desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. So once we sell, see ourselves seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father. See, we're not physically there, but my place, I, I'm connected to the head. And when the scripture says, I am seated with Christ in him, that means I have a place of authority. I've been given a place of authority and to use and exercise that authority. Hallelujah. So when we were born again, remember, our spirit was recreated. Our spirit was made brand new. That spirit man is brand new in us. But the soul has to be transformed, has to be renewed. And God transforms us, what, from the inside out. Transforms us from the inside out. I uh, want to just kind of close up with this here because there's more to share, but very familiar scripture verse, and this will be the Passion Translation of 1 Peter 2, verses 9 through 12. This is who we are. This is who we are in him. 1 Peter 2. This is the Passion Translation. They'll put it up. If you don't have it, you can follow along. Starting in verse 9, it says, But you are God's chosen treasure. See, when the world wants to remind you that you're a dog, you need to say, I'm God's chosen treasure. And your mind might be saying otherwise and trying to get in agreement or think low of yourself. No, you are God's chosen treasure. He died for you. He spilled his blood and he became the enormity in all facets of sin for all people. So when you see people trying to do things against people, you know it ain't God. You know it's not just and right. And I ain't with it. And I don't care how unpopular it is to get up and say, I don't stand with that. I don't agree with it. I don't march with that tune. I am marching with that because if people hurt people and go after people, then if it's that, it's not of God. And I say, it be that simple. It's not complicated. But then it goes on. It says, but you are God's chosen tre treasure, priests who are kings. See, you're a king. You know, they talk, 
They had a daughters of the king. Yeah, you are a king. Male or female, there's an, you are a king in Christ. You need to think like one. I remember, you know, this is back in the, in the early 80s. I used to go to a lot of Kenneth Copeland meetings, uh, 80, 81, 82. And um, I remember T.L. Osborne, when he was alive, he would minister a lot at those meetings. I remember getting on the elevator with him, and I said, hello. He's very short. He's, he's down here. And he had this bright, fiery beard. And this is how he talked. He said, when I got off the plane, he said, royalty has arrived. That's how he talked. Oh, yeah. And he would have hundreds of thousands of people at his crusades. And he said, when I came down off the plane, royalty has arrived. He thought royal. Because the word says you are. So this is why we have to think this way. And not embrace. Don't identify with the world and its ways. Because it wants to hurt people, abuse people, step on people, not elevate people. And it goes on. It says, priests who are kings, a spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light. That's why he called us out of darkness. To experience his marvelous light. Now he claims you as his very own. He claims you. <laughs> Even when we're acting stupid, he's got a claim upon us. He said, you're mine. You know how some spouses are stupid? And the wife has to remind the husband, you're mine. Don't be stupid, you're mine. Or the wife be stupid and the husband go, you're mine. Honey, you're mine. Don't be stupid. See, and God's got a claim upon us. He said, you're mine. Don't be stupid. Right? Right? We need to remind ourselves. He did this. I like this. He's got a claim. He claims you as his very own. He said, he did this so that you would broadcast. See, you're all broadcasters. Did you know that? See, you're all budding broadcasters, right? And it said, so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders Throughout the world. We are to broadcast the good news. Hallelujah. Throughout where? The world. For at one time, you were not God's people, but now you are. At one time, you knew nothing of God's mercy. Because you hadn't received it yet. But now you are drenched with it. Oh yeah, I like that. I'm drenched with his mercy. My divinely loved friends, since you are resident aliens and foreigners in this world, I appeal to you to divorce yourself from the evil desires that wage war within you. He's appealing to us to separate us, to divorce ourselves from the evil desires that wage war within you. If you look that up in the King James, it says the evil desires, or it says the, those passions that wage war in your soul. They don't wage war in your heart because your spirit's brand new. But there's a war sometimes going on in your soul. Live, I like this, verse 12. Live honorable lives as you mix with unbelievers. 
even though they accuse you of being evildoers. For they will see your beautiful works and have a reason to glorify God in the day he visits us. So we are to live honorable lives in front of people, not participate in their evil things, no matter how tempting it may be. Because sometimes it can be tempting. Oh, yeah, I'm going to participate in that. I know through the years here, even just working in sound, I had opportunities. People invited me to go things. I wasn't quick. Sometimes I got to check. I didn't feel comfortable. Sometimes I would go to Pastor Clinton and I'd say, I got this invitation. And, he'd, and you know what he'd always say to me? Almost invariably, this is what he'd say to me. Well, just be led. <laughs> I said, thanks. <laughs> but you know what he was really doing? I'm not the Holy Ghost. So if I keep going to him and he gives me an answer, then I'm going to get into the habit of going, well, what do you think about that? That's like a parent always making choices for their children. At some point, they're going to have to make their own choices. And they're going to have to make choices. And, it, and, and you can't feel guilty about, oh, man, my child made that. That's the dumbest thing. I should have done this. No, if you did everything you did, needed to do and they made some bad choices, pray for them. But don't feel guilty because they made some bad choices. Pray for them. And if they get stuck in something, pray for them. Love them. But don't feel guilty because somebody made some bad choices. I mean, God expects us to pray for people, and the scripture tells us people that are entrapped in sin, pray for them. But if we've done everything, you know, that's like. You feeling guilty because somebody went to hell. Do you think for one moment that God didn't try to reach out to that person over and over and over and over and over and over to reach out and beckon them to receive him? I was just being used in whatever way he used me to reach that person. And I don't know, really, when it gets down to it, I don't know if a person did or didn't. I really don't know. They may have rejected the gospel, and five minutes later, the light comes on, and they accepted Christ and left this earth. I don't know. So sometimes we need to think about, you know, those, those things about worry and guilt and all of that. You know, that's what I like. Uh, let's just close with this scripture. I know I'm going a little long, but let's just, uh, I'm going to read this in Romans chapter 8, 1. Because it fits, fits right here. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2 in the Passion Translation. And I like this. This kind of puts a coda on this. You know what a coda is? Like a, a period. A musical coda. So the Passion Translation, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, it says, So now the case is closed. Sin has been paid for. In all of its extremes, the case is closed. Now all I need to do is do what? Receive it and mix faith and walk in it because sin's power has been deprived. And it goes on. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life with Jesus. So if there's a condemnation voice and it's coming through people, it ain't coming from God. Because if it comes from God, it's going to be with love, not condemnation. So if thoughts of condemnation are coming, you laugh. Ha, ha, ha. You're the one that's condemned. 
Satan. It says here, Verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life flowing through the anointing of Jesus has liberated us from the law of sin and death. We're free people. And we're in Christ. And let's enjoy the ride. Enjoy this life. Enjoy who we are in Christ. Not be free full of fear and worry and trouble and all of this. Nope. We're going to enjoy being in Christ. Didn't say it wasn't going to come with some stuff, but we overcome the stuff in him. Right? Yeah. Amen. Father, we thank you today for your word. Thank you that it is truth and life to us. And we thank you for living in us and revealing yourself in a greater way to us. We thank you that we receive the word that has been spoken today and revealed. Thank you that we purpose to walk in it and divorce ourselves from those things that wage war in our soul. And we thank you that we see ourselves as kings and priests unto God. And we thank you, Father, for this royalty thinking that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Glory to God. Praise God. Amen. You know, so often, when you have a better covenant, and I know even Pastor Sarah and, and, and also Minister Dolores, would go to Sullivan Correctional Facility, which most, were either minimum they were in for 25 years, most were in for life. So they had no way of getting out. Most of them didn't want to get out. They were content in Christ. But they would continually teach them who they are in Christ. Because when you know who you are, it doesn't matter what situation you find yourself in, you're at peace. So you could be incarcerated with no possibility of ever getting out, and you're at peace. Or there are some, I mean, we've met even a local pastor here. He was a gangbanger. He was in for 25 to life. He's out. Been a pastor for, I don't know, 20 plus years. Local Assembly of God. Good brother. And, um, you know, so there's different paths for each people, for each individual. But whatever path God has for us, be faithful and true to that. Be faithful to him. Be faithful to the covenant that we have with him. And faithful to the name of Jesus faithful. Just be faithful. Because God has a different path for each one of us and different seasons in our life. Just be faithful in those seasons that he has you in, right? Praise God. So today, just before we leave, well, let's receive our, our um, offering. But before we do that, if anybody's watching or anybody's here today, that doesn't remember, I'll just say it that way, doesn't remember asking Jesus into their heart. Maybe you believed that Jesus is the Christ. You know, Hebrew or Romans chapter 8, verse 3, I think it is, it says, God sent him in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. So he sent him here, he sent Jesus here, to be the mediator, to pay for sin for all mankind. And but it was put to our credit, or you could say our account, he paid for us, paid for the for the, 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 the what was against us, the sin that was against us, and accounted against us, he paid for that and freed us. So it was put to our account that it's been paid for. 
But we have to do what? Believe it, mix faith with it, and confess that. That I received Jesus and what he did for me, and I believe that he was raised from the dead. So if you, if you make that simple profession and believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, then the scripture says you become saved. And instantly your spirit has changed. He takes up residence. He comes in and lives. But then this, this, this is where we talk about today. We have to learn who we've become. We have to learn this new covenant. And that begins to change our thinking. So let's, if you're here today, you don't ever remember making that public profession and you desire to, then make this simple profession. Father God, I believe that you sent Jesus to this earth in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. I believe that you raised him from the dead and he paid for our sins. I ask you, Jesus, come into my heart. Make someone, make something new of me. Cleanse me with your blood. And work in me a new life. And I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you said that simple prayer... Let us know here. If you did, we'll give you some free information. And if you happen to be watching online, they'll put up some information as to how to contact us, either by email or you can write or just call us. And let us know and we'll send you some free information. Praise God. Anybody here today receive Christ? Because we'll give you, let somebody know, uh, let me know that you did that and we'll get some free information to you today. Amen. Praise God. Well, we're going to receive our offering before we dismiss. This is our time to sow. And um, I'm going to just read a few scriptures. You know, the more you read, the more you see. The more you read the word, the more you see in the word. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly, shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And the Amplified says, who's prompt, a prompt to do it, giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, this is God, he God, gives seed or ministers seed to the sower, both he also gives his seed to sow, and then he, it says, both minister bread for your food. And multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. You know, something I was sharing with Pastor Greg, I've been meditating on this, this kind of fluttered up in my thinking and my heart this week on this one particular scripture verse. That's why, you know, if any of you have been around here for a long time, Pastor Clinton would sing the same offering song week after week, year after year, year after year, year after year, year after year. He sang the same song. Because the more you sing something, the more you read something, the more you see. So I like reading this, and there was something that fluttered up. All I heard was, increase the fruits of your righteousness. Ooh, boy, I got stuck on that this week. Increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now, 
anytime there's increase, it has to come through revelation. Because anytime there's increase on your part, you're doing it because you see something from the Word of God and you're acting in faith. So anytime there's increase, it must be, and I would say, it's due to a increase in revelation. So you can see even from here, he that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. So increase is tied to your sowing. And increase will bring greater revelation. And greater revelation will cause you to walk in a greater level of faith. And when you operate in a greater level of faith, then you begin to produce more fruit. Sila, think about it. That's why it's important to increase or to sow more in whatever we're doing because with that comes greater revelation, greater insight, greater seeing. And when I see something, this is back to the covenant, when I see something in the covenant in a greater way, I do it. So when folks are going... I can't get it out. Well, it's not that it's so much that it's not from God. They don't see in the covenant the value of sowing. So with greater sowing comes greater insight, greater revelation in the covenant. I'm not saying somebody should give to the place where they neglect responsibilities. We're not, we're not saying that. But as God prompts and he shows you revelation, reveals to you, because each one of us gets revelation differently, isn't it? It's due to our sowing. So when I see something, what's my response? When I see something... What's my response? I should act upon it. Because revelation reveals something, faith comes. When revelation comes, faith is there. When it was revealed to you that you needed Jesus, you acted upon it. I need this. So you acted in faith. When you see something in the covenant, when you see and God prompts you to do something, to give of your time, to give of your finances, to give love, to give joy, something, when you have a greater revelation of that, what's our response? To do it. And the more you do it, the more revelation comes and you see the value of the covenant. You see. And the power of the covenant. Because the covenant is sealed in the blood. He will make sure it comes to pass. He said what? I watch over my covenant to make it come to pass. That's why when this says, he which soweth sparingly shall. You can't give little and expect a lot. You can't give a lot and expect Paquito. You can't. You, 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 you can't. You see. So I'm just sharing all of that. He does what? Increase. So increase is tied to greater revelation. Glory to God. Praise God. Everybody ready to give? I did enough talking, but I just felt impressed to share that. Let's raise our seed and release our faith.
Father, I thank you for this, my seed that I'm bringing into the kingdom of God, into this house that you've raised up, and I thank you that all of its needs are met. I thank you that you've established this ministry and every assignment will come to pass. Thank you, Father, for the eternal words that you spoke to Pastor Clinton. The people will come and the money will come. We believe that. We call in, as you've instructed us, $80,000 this week, and we believe we receive it and we have it. And we set ourselves in agreement. Father, I thank you that our needs are met. You promised that you would give us seed to sow, bread for food. You would multiply my seed sown, and you would increase the fruits of my righteousness. Thank you that my bank accounts are full. Thank you that the windows of heaven are open unto me. And you are rebuking the devourer for my sake. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. Praise God. Well, have a great week. And um, keep, keep the switch of faith turned on. And let's say this as we leave. The word that I've heard is working mightily in me. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you, Pastor, for those encouraging words. As we prepare to be dismissed, make sure that you've gathered all your personal belonging with you. He is Lord over it. And the word says you have the mind of Christ, so we should act like it. Praise God. As you prepare to leave, make sure, like I said, you have all your personal belonging with you. We're going to uh, ask that if you desire to become a part of this particular part of the body of Christ uh, as a new congregant or someone returning to the body, we're going to ask that you come to this, my right side, the first row over here after, after you're dismissed and have a seat on in that area. Also, if you have any need, we're going to ask whether it's receiving the Holy Spirit and the evidence of speaking with the tongues, you can come down to my left and have a seat over here and someone be there to minister to you. It is a pleasure to be a servant of God, to serve him on a daily basis. So as you prepare to leave, greet one another with the love of God.